we begin. Of course, it's being I don't know, for the record, for the recording and watched on YouTube. So I'm sure there'd be a lot of interested people. Thank you. Just give the friends another 20 seconds or so. Okay, let's, um, let's begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all the friends around the world. It's my honor to um, welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, which is on endoscopic ventriculostomy, the basics, tips, and pearls. Uh, it's my pleasure to once again welcome two of the world's uh, authorities uh, in this field of neuroendoscopy uh, who have joined us and uh, agreed to uh, support the, the CSF task force, maybe section to be uh, in this aspect. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, and thank Professor Henry Schroeder, Professor of Neurosurgery at Kreuzwald Unit in Germany, uh, who frankly needs no introduction uh, and is, um, has been in leading roles in the field of neuroendoscopy and minimally invasive neurosurgery for many years, particularly in the WFNS. And so a big thank you to Henry. Thank you once again for joining us and uh, teaching us so much and being part of this. Huge thank you also to Professor Ahmad Zohdi from Cairo in Egypt, Professor of Neurosurgery and truly one of the other world authorities in this field. And we are honored to, to have him here talking to us and uh, teaching us and sharing his experiences, which is uh, priceless. So thank you both very much. Um, so perhaps without any further ado, um, maybe I could invite Henry to begin and then following Henry's talk, Ahmad and uh, questions in between and more questions and answers at the end. If I could invite the participants to please put their questions in the Q&A section and any comments they like in the chat. Uh, welcome to everybody, thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yes, thank you, Manzo, for the very nice introduction. And thank you for the invitation of me and Ahmed for the webinar of the CSF Task Force of the ENS. And I hope we, we have a good discussion about this topic. You propose that we talk about endoscopic cervicalostomy, which is really uh, the most frequently performed neuroendoscopic procedure. And it's uh, very important that everybody is is uh, able to do this. That's why it should be integrated in the training. And I'm really surprised <clears throat> that in some institutions, ETV is not done, but only the shunt. That is really surprising for me. When we started in the early 90s with neuroendoscopy, I thought it's about 10 years and everybody will know how to do and will do it. So today I want to talk about my technique. I don't want to review too much literature, but just to show what I think is important. Endoscopic subventriculostomy is, is a straightforward procedure, but if you don't follow certain rules, it might be life-threatening. And I know for very sure that the mortality and morbidity rate of ETV is clearly underreported in the literature. Only a few people are honest and report their problems. And I, I know it because I was expert witness in some of these lawsuits which happened in Europe and there are more severe complications than is reported. And that's why it's so important that you know about the technique and some prerequisites which should be taken to avoid complications. <clears throat> so we use the lotter ventriculoscope for a ventriculostomy. You can use a standard lotter, but it's much more convenient when you use a little lotter. And I will show you why. <clears throat> the diameter has a big difference. And what we use, we have this endoscopic sheath which is sometimes introduced through the subventriculostomy in the, into the basal cistern. And then we cut all these membranes which interfere with the CSF circulation. I think this is important in some cases. <clears throat> so the outer diameter is 3.6. 
And when you take the endoscopic sheets, it's 4.5. So we fix the endoscope with a mechanical holding arm. So with the left hand, you guide the endoscope left, right, in, out. And with the right hand, you control the instrument. Neural navigation, we only rarely use for ETV. Usually you have dilated ventricles. And then I think it's not required to have it. We discuss this always in our courses. And some people say, why? It's just an addition of 10 minutes and it gives you more safety. And everybody knows that sometimes the position of the ventricular catheter is not ideal when you see it on the post-op uh, CT or a MRI. That's why some people say it should be done in all cases with navigation. I say if the ventricles are really wide, I think it's not, not necessary. But this is debatable. This is our setup. So usually we sit, sometimes we stand and we have the images in front of us. So what is the indication of ETV? The indication is any type of occlusive hydrocephalus with obstruction behind the anterior third ventricle. Everything which dilates the lateral ventricle, the, lateral, the third ventricle can be an indication <clears throat> for an endoscopic third ventricle ostomy. What we do is a special MRI images before you do the surgery because you want to see exactly what is the anatomy. And that is very, very important that you look accurately to the MR images. So we have this in inversion recovery turbo spin echo sequence, which shows flow as a black signal. And you see there's no flow in the aqueduct showing an occlusion. And then we have this high resolution T2 weighted imaging, which is cis constructive in this steady state. In Siemens machine, it can be drive or Fiesta, depending what machine you use, but it's a high resolution T2 weighted image. <clears throat> and you see very nicely, here's a bulging of the anterior uh, from the lamina terminalis, distortion of pituitary stalk, bulging of the floor, pre-stenotic dilation of the aqueduct, all signs of aqueductal stenosis, which is a perfect indication for endoscopic ostomy. <clears throat> also, when you have an obstruction of the outlet for the tetraventricular hydrocephalus, there's no need to open this here to just go in, make an endoscopic ostomy, and you see how nicely you restore the flow and have resolution of the symptoms. So very easy procedure, no need to make complicated ones. The position of the borehole and the entrance is very important. Usually we place the borehole just in front of the coronary suture. There are some studies showing that sometimes even better you come behind because then you go directly through the foramen and you puncture in the direction of the clivus, not to the basilar. But in most of my cases, I like to have it exactly in front of the coronary suture, not one centimeter in front, but just I want to see the coronary suture and there I place it. That in most cases is working very well. If you want to make in the same surgery, simultaneously a biopsy to the pineal region, then of course it's not a good. Then we place this two centimeter in front of the coronary suture. So I have an approach to the anterior floor of the third ventricle and to the uh, entrance to the aqueduct. So it's in between the ideal points. When you only go to the aqueduct, usually it's four to five centimeters in front of the coronary suture. So it depends where you want to go. This is our positioning, what we have. You can fix the head in a sharp fixation, but it's not required. But you have to talk to the anesthesiologist that you really relax the patient. I had it once in my experience that the patient wants to get up when the endoscope was introduced. That is a disaster. So this must not happen. So if you should ask, they should have complete relaxation of the patient that he's not moving, then you can simply place him in a horseshoe. Otherwise, it's better you fix it, fix it in a, a sharp fixation. <clears throat> then we make a borehole, one centimeter in diameter. And then what I usually do, I puncture the ventricle with the Scott cannula or, 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 or uh, Cushing cannula. And then I take CSF sample for investigation. Then you have also checked the trajectory before you come with a big scope. So then the cannula is removed and I go in with, with the endoscope. And then you go through the foramen of one row to the floor. The floor may look very different. It's interesting. The vari variability is very large. That is the ideal floor. You see the infundibular recess, you see mammillary bodies, and you see here the basilar. And it's a translucent floor. So I know I have to place my, my opening right here. But it's not always the case. Sometimes look like this, also very translucent, but here you see a vessel. What is it? This is uh, the PCOM. 
which runs um, very, very much under the floor. So it's very variable. And then, of course, we go a little bit to the lateral side and make the opening here. Here you see the oculomotor nerve. Sometimes the floor is like this. You don't know where is the basilar. That's why it's so important that you look to the pre-op MRI to see the position of the basilar artery. And then you make your um, decision where to make the opening. One thing which is very important, never go behind. Even if this is more translucent, never go behind the basilar because if you inflate the balloon, you may rupture a perforating artery and that is a disaster. So always you should stay in front. You see here, it's like an arachnoid cyst. This is all floor bulging down. Around two centimeters goes down along the clivus and then comes up like in an arachnoid cyst, but it's all floor. And then, of course, it's not good that you make the opening here or here. You just go to the clivus because you can not damage anything. You can open the floor here, then it starts to come up and pulsate. <clears throat> or here you have a very, very dominant PCOM, the fetal origin of the posterior cerebral artery. And then, of course, you go somewhere here to open it. But never go here, even if you see here it's translucent, but you see all the perforators here. You have, should always stay in front of the basilar to avoid this damage and then we open it with a deck forceps deck forceps is a blunt tip forceps which has outside the teeth that is ideal for blunt opening of the floor and then we take a forgetty balloon to inflate you see when you see this nice floor here should be the opening halfway in between infundibular recess and mammillary bodies right in the midline <clears throat> and then we have the balloon and open it here you see this is the floor is open, but below there is a liliquous membrane. And it is of utmost important that the liliquous membrane is open too. Otherwise, you will not have the pulsatile flow. The pulsatile flow in front of the brainstem is very important. <clears throat> what we want to see after we make the cerebral glossomy is the basilar and the perforator. So we know we are in the subarachnoid space. This should be seen after your ETV. Otherwise, you are in the wrong space. And one example, you see this is a young lady, severe triventricular hydrocephalus, bulging of the anterior of the lamina terminalis, bulging of the floor. And you see there might be a tactile glioma. You see here a small tumor, large ventricle. So for this, I don't need navigation. We just go in. And that is a view what you get. You see for Raymond of Monroe with the septal vein, cinnamous dried vein, toil plexus, this was a phonics, mammillary bodies. And this is ideal. You see, it's a very thin floor, translucent. I see P1, P1. So I take the deck forceps, open the floor, dilate it. And then there is again the Fagotti, Fagotti balloon catheter, two French or three French, depends what. Um, what kind of catheter you use. And then you have to bring the equator of the balloon exactly at the level of the floor. Sometimes it slips down and up and you have to play a little bit, but I think it's magical. And here see below, you see, this is a liliquous membrane. This should be open too. When the liliquous membrane is soft, like in this case, then it's enough with the balloon to dilate it as well. If you see it's very tough, sometimes you need scissors, but that is rare. The balloon is pre-filled with saline, so we have a constant, slowly uh, enlargement. You see the floor is pulsating. This is a 30 degree endoscope, and you see this is a basilar artery. That is what I want to see. And if you see this pulsation of the floor, then you know that the floor in front of the brainstem is restored. So that is what we want to see. And you see if you position the, the borehole correctly, there's no damage to the veins. There's uh, the post-op MRI shows nicely the flow void in front of the basilar. So this is the ideal thing what we want to see. And in these tumors, tactile tumors, we have a very, very high success rate over 90%. There's one theory of the extraventricular CSF pathway obstruction raised by Kehler from Hamburg, from Germany. And he says, when here are membranes and you see the bulging of the floors, there must be a pressure differential between the ventricles and the basal cisterns, and that is an indication for ETV as well. So when we go in, you see this is a, the shaft of the little lotta. The frame of Monroe is very small. You have to expect that when you visualize the MRI pre-op, then you see the floor. The optic is a little lotta. 
we open the floor with the deck forceps. Then we take the Fogadi Balloon Catheter. We dilate. This floor is a little bit thick, so it's not translucent. But according to the MRI, I know where's the position of the bezel are. So we open it. Slowly enlargement with the balloon, which is filled with saline. You should not be filled. It should not be filled with air because then you have this pop-up phenomenon. So we open here the first membrane, the liliquist membrane from the dorsum cellae. And then we go with the sheath into the cistern. You see here is another membrane. With this sheath of the little lotta, I can protect the basilar. So I can cut because I know the basilar is under the sheath. So we open this membrane. And usually you need scissors because they are tough. And then we go down, you see it's another membrane. And again, my endoscopic sheath is protecting the basala. And I again use scissors to open this membrane. It's no chance with a balloon because the membrane is very tough. So we open it. And then you see the beginning of the pulsation showing that the flow is good. And when we go in, you see this is a clivus. What, what nerve is this? This is Abducens nerve. And now we can go back and you see there's a good pulsation of our third ventriculostomy. These membranes are very important. You see now here we have the flow. It's very important. For example, this is a child who underwent four times an endoscopic third ventriculostomy in another institution, and he presented always as failure. So what is the question? This was a tumor surgery initially. So as the aqueduct is occluded, you see some hemosiderine spots here. <clears throat> and the aqueduct is completely occluded, the so aqueduct stenosis. So we open the floor, it was scar formation, but still we were able with the deck forceps to open it. Then we take a Fugatti balloon catheter and dilate it. So the question is why it was always closing because it is an aqueductal stenosis should be a good sign, but you see there are a lot of membranes. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> there are a lot of membranes and with scissors, we cut along the clivus all these membranes to restore the prepontine CSF flow. And that is very important. If you don't do this, there's no flow. And then of course the floor may close easily. So the message is membrane should be open. It's another case had also previous cervicalostomies. So chronic hydrocephalus, multiple shunt revisions, all shunt failed. And he came here for another attempt of ETV. We look around here, you see aqueduct completely occluded. And this is a posterior commissure with the endoscope looking to the back. So in this case, we took energy, what we usually don't do. But here it was exactly on the clivus. There's no space between the mammillary bodies and the clivus. So we have to go very close to the clivus. So we open it here. And then we take the Fogatti balloon catheter. And then we check and we want to see the basilar. But what we see, we see just the arachnoid sac. What means? We have entered the subdural space, but not the subarachnoid space. And that is, of course, wrong. This will never work. So we have to displace the mirror bodies with our endoscopic sheath. And now we open carefully with scissors the arachnoid membrane. And then we dilate it. So you have to end up in the subarachnoid space. If you enter here in the subdural space, that's wrong. It should not be done. Tumor related hydrocephalus, I told you. You have to look to the MRI, is the foramen of Monroe white? Then you can take one burrow, which is about two centimeters in front of the coronal sutures, and you can reach it. But if this foramen is very small, please don't do it, then it will not work. But in most cases, I must admit, in most of our cases, it was working. We make an ETV, we tilt the endoscope to the back, and then we take the biopsy. There's one trick, you can turn the endoscope 180 degrees, then the working channel is not up, but down then the amount of tilting is reduced while you take a biopsy. For example, this forceps would then be here, so you need, don't need to tilt too much. Narrow space between, 
because it shows you a difficult situation when you have a very narrow space between the clivus and Oops. the this is with sound. Nice. That is surprising. But you see, there is an artery. Uh, there's a small tumor, and there's no space between mammillary bodies and the clivus. So the borehole is placed in between the ideal point for an EDV and for the aqueduct access. You see, we have. Can you hear this, Mansoor? Yes, we can. But uh, it's fine, Henry. You can talk over it, or you can turn down. And the sound on your laptop as you like. Yeah, but I can. Don't worry, it's not a not a big problem. Yeah, I Please don't worry. Now. So here you see, it's also no space. This is a clivus, and here's a mammillary body. So I have to be very close to it. And there was an arachnoid membrane which was not open, so I had to take scissors. This, of course, is a little bit risky. So you must be very careful that you are only superficial, because below are the branches of the of the bezel arm, um, but you have no space. But I must admit, I had never to give up an ETV because there was no space. There's always a little bit space. And you see, here's the bezel arm. This is a mammillary body. So we could restore the CSF circulation. And then we tilted the endoscope to take a biopsy. So the success rate is a report in the literature. It varies depending on what is your indication for inclusion. If you only take tactile tumors, you have a success rate over 90%. If you take aqueductal stenosis, it goes to 70%. If you take communicating hydrocephalus, it goes even more down. So in our series, we have now done almost 500 cases and we had evaluated when we had 300 cases and you see we have two mortalities and uh, we have permanent mobilities, three patients with permanent problems. What is about endoscopic subventriculostomy in kids? So the problem in infants is the brain is more vulnerable. CSF absorption is a problem and etiology plays a major role. For example, this is a child at the date of birth and you see it looks, there's no brain. But if you make a shunt, you see how much brain comes back. This is interesting. And they're always the critic is when you make an endoscopic semiglostomy that the ventricles do not come so much down like with a shunt. And then the question is, are large ventricles an indication that the development, neurocognitive development is not as good as with a shunt? The second question is, is age a prognostic factor? This is a 13-year-old female with aqueductal stenosis. You see large ventricles. The mother came to us for giving birth to the child because she does not want to have a shunt. And you see, this is the situation. And then we made a subventriculostomy. It's the same what I showed you. We open it. And then you see the cortical mantle becomes much thicker than before. And you see, this is here the time of ETV. It was outside the 95 percentile, and then it goes down to this. But it's not going more down like in the shunt. And this five years after ETV, you see it's still much more brain around than at the time of birth. And this is a comparison. You see, it is less wide. For me, this was a cure. She was seen by another doctor and she said, oh, she needs a shunt, she has so wide ventricles. But is this really necessary, yes or no? Comparison here, after eight years, it's still good. 13 years after surgery, no complaints. And the copic colostomy is wide open and she's doing fine. Just she has wide ventricles. And there was an interesting study performed by um, Kalkani and colleagues. And they found that there's no association between large ventricle size and, and white matter injury and the neurocognitive deficits. So even if you have white ventricles, that's not only, it's not per se a sign that you have not a good development. And there was the International Infant Hydrocephalus Study, which was uh, initiated by Shlomi Constantini and Spira Sewers. And they also showed that there is no difference in the long-term outcome between ETV and shunt. Although in the ETV cases, usually the ventricles remain larger. So it's very important to know. There's one example, 10 months old boy, initially normal, and then he has decelerated psychomotor development. And he has an hydrocephalus, and here are some strange structures. If you look to the T2 axial, you see 
there is a DVA, a develop, developmental venous anomaly exactly at the level of the, of the aqueduct. So when we go in, we see the foramen of Monroe, we enter, and you see already here some strange veins, which are not at the floor usually. And then we take a 30 degree endoscope to look back to the aqueduct. And what you see here was interesting. There was a DVA obstructing the aqueduct. It's interesting. So it had developed initially, it was okay, but then later on he did get the problem. So please don't try an aqueductoplasty in this case. That might be ill advised. The simple thing is you just do an endoscopic telependiculostomy. You see, this was the old scope, it was a fiberscope. That's why the, the image quality is not as good. But we make simply an endoscopic telependiculostomy. We open here the liliquous membrane with the, with the balloon catheter. In children, usually the membranes are not so tough when they are very young and have no infection. And you see, we have the subarachnoid space and good resolution of the hydrocephalus. This was also an interesting case. That was a girl, 70 years old, and she had problems, respiratory distress. When she has pressive activity, she had increase of headache, vomiting, nausea, and she came with this, with this image. You see syringomyelia, white ventricles. And interesting, she had an MRI before in 1997, so seven years before, but she was clinically asymptomatic. So they requested no procedure. They did not want, and then you see it's progressing, progressing and causes secondary Chiari malformation because the pressure of the ventricles pushes it down. And then we just make an ETV and you see how nicely it, it recovers. We just open here and the, because of the resolution of the ventricular size, decrease of the ventricular size, the brainstem came up and the searings resolved. This was our experience written by Joachim Ertl from Hamburg, put all the cases together and they found that the ETE success rate was 70% in our whole series and shunt dependence in 26, but depending from the age, you see when we have, when we have the very young below six months of age, the success rate is less than 50%. So that's why in these cases, we are very reluctant to do it. If we have just aqueductus stenosis, we would do it, but if there's any kind of infection or hemorrhage, it's not good. So what are factors for failure? Age below six months, hemorrhage and infection is clearly, when you open the, the floor of third ventricle and you see these membranes, you see everything is scarred. It makes no sense to try to open. It's different to the cases I showed you. Post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus in young kids, please don't do it. And there's also the recommendation published in the um, uh, Journal of Neurosurgery. You see here, endoscopic cephalonyclerostomy. There is insufficient evidence to recommend use of endoscopic cephalonyclerostomy in premature infants with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus. And I strongly agree, this success rate is so less that it's not worth to try it. Please make a shunt. If they come back with shunt failure and you see obstructive component of the hydrocephalus, when they are older than two years, you have a much better chance to be successful. Is, IC, is CPC useful? There are a lot of studies from Uganda and they showed this, that ETV with uh, co choroplexus coagulation has the same uh, outcome like shunting. There was an American study and North America performed and they found that uh, ETV on CPC has a higher failure rate than shunting. So that's why, and we have not so much very young kids we have done it very rarely. So I cannot give you my personal experience, but according to the literature, I think ETV and CPC, it adds not too much, obviously. But further studies are underway. There's a prospective study in North America, and then we will see. <clears throat> we had one case of a, of a girl with severe ascites after shunting. And they came to us and you see, there are very prominent choroplexus here. Very, very, very thick choroplexus. And when we went in, we thought it might be the reason. So we used a lot of from both sides because the plexus is so thick that with a flexible, it would take too long. And you see, this is a hypertrophic choroplexus in the temporal horn. You see here's a hypocampus. 
So we place the borehole here so we can go to the lateral ventricle, to the frontal horn, and we go down to the temporal horn. But you see how thick this plexus is, and it took one and a half hour for each side to coagulate, even though we use the lotter and not the flexible, where the bipolar is much, much smaller. But we, we took a lot of effort to really coagulate all these coral plexus on both sides. And it's interesting, the ventricles came more down, and one day later, the ascites was gone. So if the plexus is producing too much CSF, I think it's a good option. In the other cases, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, I'm not convinced, but I personally have not so much experience. What is the shunt failure? Shunt failure, we published it uh, some years ago, and we found a success rate of 60%, no mortality, no permanent mobility, so it is safe to perform it. And the shunt, uh, if you have shunt infection, the success rate is less. If it's just a malfunction, success rate is better. And we had no success if the MRI shows there's communicating hydrocephalus. But if there's obstructive hydrocephalus, usually aqueductal stenosis, success rate is really good. And it's recommended in shunt failures to try at least a venoscopic subventriculostomy. You see, this is a lady. She was a visitor here. She had 40 years shunt dependence, came with this hydrocephalus with vomiting, headache, and you see bulging of the floor. So what we did, we just make an endoscopic ventriculostomy, and immediately she starts to starts with reabsorption of CSF, so she does not need any time. She was immediately after surgery fine. So even if you have a long-term shunt dependence, it can be a very, very good option to try first an ETV. If this is not working, you can later present with a shunt. What are complications? In our, uh, in our meta-analysis, what we did, we had the mortality for 0.1%. Uh, Complication rate varies from 0 to 20%, depending on the series, what you, what you see. This is a complication rate, what we published in 2002. And we have a mortality 0.6, permanent mobility 1%. What was the problem? We had organ motor palsy because you see the perforation was not performed in midline, but too far lateral. We had another case, diabetes and zebitis permanent because the ETV was performed exactly in infundibulum, also a surgical mistake. And we had one confusion because one outflow channel of the scope was blocked and it was irrigated, 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 and the CSF does not came out in a proper way. So all are three problems which were related to inexperience of the surgeon should not happen. What is the mortality? We have one little lethal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Why? Because the surgeon made the perforation behind the bezeler. So the floor, the, the, um, the balloon was introduced behind the bezeler, then inflated and one perforator was ruptured. Then irrigation started for a while. It stopped, patient came to the ICU and after 12 hours he had the re-bleed and died. So also a surgical mistake. The other lethal, uh, fatal complication was a wound infection leading to meningitis and septic multic organ failure. This was an old patient in very poor general condition. Otherwise, I think this would not happen. But the first one was surgical mistake, should not happen that way. What we had else, this is a salamic infarction because we make a biopsy from this tumor. So we went in, make an ETV, and then we tilted the scope and obviously we have here, just by pressure, caused the thrombosis. So there was no rupture, no bleeding, nothing. It was just by compression causing a, a, a thalamic infarction with hemiparesis. So that's why only biopsy if it's necessary and the bowhole should be placed two centimeters in front of the coronary suture. And you see most of our complication really occurred in the initial phase of our experience later on. It is a very safe and straightforward procedure. So what is the message? Look carefully at CT and MRI to see what is the size of Raman Monroe, what is the position of the basilar. Take a appropriate endoscope. If you have small ventricles, you cannot take a big scope. Of course, this will not work. Maintain a clear view for irrig with irrigation if you have some minor bleeding, irrigation with like tetraringer solution. Correct fenestration site so important. Please don't go behind the bezel. That is the message. Blunt perforation of the floor in most of the cases is sufficient. We don't use a laser or something like this, just blunt perforation. Or you can sometimes, if you see what I showed you on the clivus, you can use energy bipolar coagulation. 
here, as was my mistake, I came in, did not look to the MRI and thought this is a clivus. But if you look, it is a basilla. So please, it looks like bone, but it's a calcified basilla. Please look at the MRI. I can only stress it more and more because I have seen so many mistakes. So I think I stop now. Thank you so much for your um, for listening, and I hope you have some questions. Thank you, Henry. As always, uh, excellent. You don't hear, um, Henry? Can you hear me? You are muted still. Um, I don't think so. Can you hear me, Henry? Ah. Maybe you are we can, mute. We can hear it's you, Mansur. Because, sorry, I think your, your laptop might be on mute. Sorry. Uh, because I still put yes, the sound yeah. <laughs> No, that's fine. Well spotted and very rapid. Um, once again, absolutely brilliant. Thank you. That was a very good, concise summary of many, many critical points. Um, one quick question, if I may, to begin with. Um, Henry, you showed beautifully how you go elegantly with your scope and using the, the guard of your uh, scope to protect the basilar and make a sharp dissection, cutting the, um, uh, the arachnoid planes and the fibers. Um, can you expand a bit more on that? Because it's scary for people who haven't done it yet in terms of what size scope that you use and a bit more about the nuances of that technique. Because from my experience, most surgeons would be very afraid to even put the scope through the stoma to have a look, but just some nuances and some tips and pearls about that aspect. So, so looking, we always do. I want to check is the size of my surgical glossomy okay. So usually I take a 30 degree endoscope, the diameter is 3.3 millimeters, and I go through this ETV to look. That I always do to check I'm in the subarachnoid space or not. When I want to work, of course, it's not possible in all cases, especially in children, when the space between the basilla and the clivus is one or two millimeters. Of course, you cannot go in with a scope or with a sheath of uh, 4.5 uh, millimeters. That is only possible in adult patients when you have space in front. So you have, this is what I said, you have to look at the images. It's very individual. You can never say I do it always that way or do it always that way. It's individual uh, medicine. And that's why we have to look. If is enough space, I go through it because I can push the bezel a little bit back. You know, because if, if there, uh, I can protect it. Of course, I could also take it without the sheath and go just with the scope because then I have only 3.6 millimeters. It is also an option. That is to be considered if you see that the sheath is too thick, then I would remove it. But then you have not the same protection. You know, you have seen, I go a little bit back in my sheath and I see all the margins of the sheath. And I know the bezel is not in my way. If I only have my endoscope, then it's not the same. It gives not the same safety. Thank you, Henry. Um, do you have any comments to make about that, Ahmed? Um, anything to add? No, I, I, I'll, I'll go into that in my presentation. OK, thank you. Um, another question is, what is the role of aqueductoplasty? Because if you can get by with an ETV, what is the merit for an intraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus in doing an aqueductoplasty? When yeah, do you do one? Yeah, yeah, we have done it. Uh, I was a big fan of aqueductoplasty because the advantage is there is no basilla which can be damaged, no perforators, there are no arachnoid adhesions around the floor which have to be open. And it's a physiological restoration of the CSF flow, so it's ideal. So we did it a lot of cases, and it looks perfect. The aqueduct looked like new. But then we have a long-term follow-up and we just published this two or three years ago that the reclosure rate is unexpectedly very high. If you don't put a stand in the aqueduct, it is obstructing. It was interesting. Dendy wrote, any attempt to restore the lumen of the aqueduct will finally fail. He stated it in one, one, uh, 1922 and he's still right. The aqueduct occludes again. And that's very, very strange. We have just two cases where the aqueduct remains open. And sometimes it's just the membrane. It's a small floating membrane. You take it off and you look and say, wow, this looks really like new. I don't know why, but there must be some proliferative activity of the ependymal that forms again a closure. And we have a lot of patients. You had really a long follow-up of these. It is disappointing. So if you make an aqueductoplasty, in most of the cases, we Pay, put a stand. And this, for me, is only indicated if you have an isolated force ventricle. 
Thank you. That, so, that's that's very clear. Thank you for that uh, final tip, particularly. Um, a, co a question from uh, Diketso um, is that what perforation technique, and I think this is a very good one, it's an international question really, what perforation technique do you suggest for institutions with no balloons? You then know? we take the deck forceps yeah. and open it. And with this, you can also make a wide opening. Yeah. And if you don't have this deck forceps, you take a biopsy forceps, just the blunt perforation. And then if you have initial opening, you can, if you have a scope of three or four millimeters, you can also push the scope itself through this opening. But I would not do what Charlie Tio has shown initially, that you just went with the scope poof, through the floor. Because when I, I have tried it once and you see everything is stretching because the floor is not so soft that it simply goes through. So that for me is a little bit scary. But if I have an initial opening and I just want to dilate it a little bit, I could take a 30 degree endoscope and just slide in to make it a little bit larger. But the initial opening, please don't do it with the scope itself. I, for me, it it's not, does not look very, very comfortable. I would not do that. Thank you, excellent. Um, Henry, that was superb, thank you. Um, what we should do perhaps is now go without further ado to Ahmad's talk and then um, we can have more time for lots of questions. Can I remind the audience and the friends to please, please put their questions in the Q&A section, please. Just write them in, I can, we can make a note and have them ready uh, for, the, for our guests. Thank you. Ahmad, welcome, please. Did I share my screen? Yes, just start the PowerPoint presentation. It should be fine. Thank you. Yes, that's it. That's Thank great. Thank you. Thank you again, Mansoor, for your invitation. It's always enjoyable and a pleasure to be with you and all the audience. And, and of course, Henry, it's always an enjoyable, uh, what we call debate, discussion, whatever. Endoscopic third ventricular system nostomy. And I meant to put it on the uh, title because actually ventriculostomy is a misnomer or uh, not the proper nomenclature because you actually uh, connect the ventricle, the third ventricle with the basal systems. So it is the proper nomenclature would be ventricular system ostomy. If you are if you are talking about endoscopic third ventricular ostomy, then we are connecting an isolated third ventricle to the lateral ventricles, as in cases of colloid cyst, as in cases of any uh, tumor or even a mere blockage of the foramen. We do uh, what we have recently published: um, Monroe endoscopic foraminoplasty. And this is not uh, the scope of this presentation. We maybe later on will be talking about this issue. So out of all the experience that I had now practically spread over three decades, uh, the main brunt of our work is the ETV. However, uh, endoscopist, as you may say, or a neurosurgeon is using his armamentarium fully and using the endoscope, the main job that you do with the endoscope is an ETV, constituting about 50% of your work. Now, if you go through, we have to know that there is actually a port of entry, which is after reaching the third ventricle with your endoscope, and you start the uh, sort of visionary, or not, I mean, under vision uh, stage of the ETV, because actually you put in your telescope instead of the uh, uh, tokar that you have put in the sheath to penetrate and to reach the ventricle. And this is what you see. This is your port of entry. And these are, of course, when you see such kind of foramen or Monroe, it's a salvation because it's a guide and it guides you directly into the target area. You see all the anterior septum, the choroidal, the 
the choroidal, the thalamus striate, the anterior caudate or anterior terminal, and the choroid plexus, and you are just free to go in to see the flow of the third ventricle, which is the second obstacle, where the target area is. And uh, this is something, again, we stress a lot of times that, of course, there are landmarks, both the mammary bodies and the pulsating basilar artery and the thinned out tuber scenario with the pre-memory uh, uh, sulcus and the uh, saccular recess and your target area here and with the dorsum celli, the most constant landmark is actually the dorsum celli with the infant in front and here is your target area. So this is the next stage or the next port or the next part that you need to violate. And once you've been through the floor, you still have to deal with the Lilliquist membrane, which is actually your port of exit and where your destination is. Your destination is the prepontine system and not the interpeduncular system. Although the, meso, the D diencephalic, mesencephalic membranes, which form the interpeduncular walls on each lateral and on the lateral sides, might be dehiscent and might serve you and might serve the purpose and might drain the CSF and might. Uh, give you a, a, a successful uh, ATV result. But you still have to make sure that the mesencephalic membrane has some sort of pathway or this type of pathway. Preferably, you should snap this more open or use slightly a balloon, cautiously, of course and to have a real visual confirmation with your telescope going into the prepontine system. It's, it's, it's again, and this is something I always uh, highlight and uh, I've been preaching that for the past three decades. The tedious learning curve is definitely shortened by your command of the morbid anatomy. And the more you see, the more uh, you know, and the more you know, the more you see, the more you see, and you, the more uh, anatomical landmarks that you identify. Put in mind that this issue of the endoscopy being a 2D, especially underwater, this is a true fact, but you get to learn the third D uh, through the elimination, through the zooming in, the zooming out, the shadow, et cetera, et cetera. And additionally, you get to know a fourth D and a fifth D. The fourth D is your being here, there, and everywhere. This motion parallax, the shades and the illumination, of course, and where you are now, and then going deeper down, going up. This is another uh, dimension. And the fifth dimension, which you get to learn with the learning curve, uh, and what you pass through is the pathological changes and the chronicity of the hydrocephalic changes and the changes in the morbid anatomy as things progress. Well, these are just short, uh, this is just a short introduction to go further that you might be faced with this uh, picturesque foramen of Monroe or with this foramen of Monroe. And these are actually not predictable. You are just with the telescope on your own and you find yourself facing these kind of foramen of Monroe. Of course, this is the perfect one that you would see with all the anatomical landmarks in and around. And it is actually your compass and guide to the target area. Let me go back to the fact that this is the fifth D, the degree of hydrocephalus and chronicity. You see how the fornix looks like here? and how it is thinned out. Once you see this picture, you know that this is a kind of chronic hydrocephalus, and most probably you will find the floor thinned out and you'll be doing your job easily. I'm talking now only and focusing on endoscopic third ventricular system mostly. Uh, on the other hand, it is the inclination, and this is why we like to leave the head free. We don't put it on a Mayfield and fix it. Um, we go, of course, to the landmarks that uh, Henry has mentioned, and uh, preferably we put the uh, the foramen, the uh, burn hole uh, directly in front or, or, or 
juxta to the uh, coronal uh, suture, and the midpoint of the uh, burr hole should be uh, according to the head and the large, maybe a large head, you would go for three centimeters from the midline, a smaller head, you would go for two and a half centimeters to the midpoint of your burr hole. These are very important landmarks because when you go in and you have a fixed head, you might find this is the normal inclination of the, for, of the uh, foramen of Monroe, and it abides to the fact of the ballooning of the third ventricle. And once the third ventricle gets ballooned and you have a type of chronic hydrocephalus, it turns with the lateral, with the medial side going higher up and the lateral side going lower down. You can see the difference. And this will, of course, um, mandate your trajectory and your telescope. How would you put your telescope and how would you go further? And this is why we prefer to have the head more or less not fixed, but on a horseshoe. Things that you might again see in the foramen of Monroe and would abort your uh, procedure is here a pinpoint kind of foramen of Monroe. Don't get, get, get too much frustrated. You can still manage it. And then this kind of wide one, which is gives you even the free uh, sort of uh, roaming around in the third ventricle and identifying all the structures. And this is how you would deal with this kind of foramen of Monroe, just gentle balloon squeezing. Don't inflate it too quickly in order not to damage the foramen. It won't be damaged uh, permanently, but you will have definitely a temporary uh, memory deficit. And then this is how it looks like, and you can go in and do your job. So this is something that I always like to show, and Henry has already showed us this kind of uh, maneuver when you go in and you find your uh, for, for him and not big enough, uh, uh, whatever kind of uh, sheath uh, uh, you have, how big it is. If this is seven millimeter or more, then you still can go in, but by sliding the sheath, and guiding it through the, uh, the foramen of Monroe till you reach your target area, you do your job, you do your visual confirmation, and then you withdraw. And as you withdraw, you identify that you did not do any damage to the foramen. Now, the third ventricle. The floor of the third ventricle is our targeted ET. We have to identify preferably all the structures from the optic chiasm to the aqueduct of Silvius, the infundibulum, the tuber cinerum, the mammary bodies, the posterior perforated substance, and the tegmentum. And hence, be able to go to the target area. Well, the sites of ETV in general are anterior, inferior, and posterior. But the usual standard teaching is the target area in the, in the inferior surface of the third ventricle. It's the thinned out tuber cinerum, mainly actually the secular recess and the pre mammillary sulcus is, be, is behind your telescope to avoid going through the pre mammillary sulcus and injuring the pre mammillary branch, which can cause a lot of bleeding. It is controllable, but not advisable. Target area in the scopic third ventricular ostomy, ideal floor with all the structures shown in front of you. And you can see, you can enjoy going through the tuber scenario, thin out tuber scenario, and you do your job. Still, these are the kinds of floor of third ventricle that you might face. And these are also not predictable by, by your imaging, water, whatever. These are things that you face while doing your job. Ideal, regular, even wide space. And then you start seeing these small spaces. And most probably you are facing that at the pediatric age group and on the posterior fossa intraventricular tumor where you would like to give the patient a, uh, some, some sort of uh, uh, 
tied him over until the definitive surgery is done. And then you are facing these kinds of tight targeting area. Here you cannot actually go through the midline. Even if you stick to the uh, dorsal celli, you might injure the basilar. So you have to go a little bit lateral. And here equally, if you stick to the midline, you might just injure the basilar again. Again, very small and tight space, but we still doable. Here you find the basilar stretched in the midline. So this uh, teaching of stick to the midline, stick to the midline is a good teaching, but you have to be ready for otherwise. Uh, this is one of the cases that I will show you in a video uh, following. Uh, this is a type of seeding that we had from a, a posterior third ventricular tube. Tumor, but this was still doable. You had your target area here and you can do it. This is not doable. This is a seeding from a false ventricular tumor, uh, medulloblastoma grade four. And this is another kind of floor that you see with the redo or repeat surgeries. And I will show you also the video later on. Now the Lilliquist membranes are the port to ETV anatomical landmarks of trabecular arachnoid, a barrier of trabecular arachnoid, very important between the supra and infratentorial system, formed of three, we even reported a fourth layer, uh, or leaflet, or sheet, or segments, or portions. Very important are, of course, that you have to, and as I will show you now, go in and violate both the diencephalic and the mesenchephalic membrane and be here to ensure that you've done your job well and documented all the kinds of, it could be cuff shape, sleeve like sheet covering all the, the, the basilar artery or a shield, even very tough. And I will show you some of these cases. It could be tough, ill-defined, thin, doubled, multiple, all these types, and the, you have to put them in mind. Very, and then you'll be able to do it, and you'll be practically sure that you've done your job well. Diencephalic, mesencephalic is also a port out of your uh, interpeduncular system, and you have to uh, sometimes look with a 30 degree to the lateral side, 30 degree telescope, and you'll find it violated, not, not uh, an intact membrane. And then even if the mesenchephalic membrane is at this side very tough, don't worry, uh, your CSF will be properly drained. Now look at this. If you do this and you go, this is your trajectory, this is where you are going to be, outside, not properly draining your CSF. If you are going in here, violating only the diencephalic membrane, then you are having this picture with the mesenchephalic still encircling, might have a wide enough opening on, this, on each side and might even these two openings might cause a sort of prepontine sort of uh, prepontine or uh, uh, supracellar arachnoid cyst that, 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 that enlarges, enlarges and, and causes uh, some sort of hydrocephalic changes, what we call uh, multilocular hydrocephalus. And then this is where you should be. And this is how it looks like, a real visual confirmation seeing the basilar freely, and you are now within the prepontine system, and you have done your procedure fully. ETV results, very quickly. ETV results were for a long, long time taken with a grain of salt. ETV success in our first reported results back in 98 was 78% for all cause hydrocephalus away from infancy, away from one year. We all know the success score. It's an excellent score. It's an 
excellent prognosticating score. It would give you a guideline. And we do our control imaging after one week, especially in infants, as we went down with the age to three months and even lower. And this is, again, away from, or not in the scope of this presentation, uh, to, to pass bypass the adaptation period, especially uh, in infants. A CT after one month will tell you that you have done uh, a good job. Uh, MRI after three months will confirm that. And I prefer always to do an MRI CSF lumetri in one year and thereafter annually. The ETV failure is a failure to circumvent the anatomical barriers and create a site track in short. So either there are secondary membranes or your stoma is not sufficient as regards the size. Failure due, four millimeter is the advisable size. Failure due to CSF malabsorption, hemorrhage, infection, high CSF protein, and tumor growth. Very interesting are these kind of uh, inferior third spontaneous autoventriculostomy. You have to be aware when you see a, a person complaining of headache and uh, having equiductal, uh, equiductal stenosis and ventriculomegaly. Check if you have this or not. This is a spontaneous, divine sort of uh, autoventriculosis stenostomy. It's not only in the inferior surface or in the uh, site of where you do your ETV, and you'll find this disconnection, and you find the patient doesn't have, it doesn't have any papilledema, actually. And the size of the, and doesn't have uh, very ventricular nuisance. Very ventricular, any, 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 any halo around the ventricles, but still some go in. It is not we are publishing this kind, this this paper about this auto, uh, this auto spontaneous ventricular systemostomy, and we are uh, reporting more than one site, uh, one site, which is the. Lamina terminalis. And again, the lamina terminalis, and this would be an anterior uh, third spontaneous autoventriculostomy. And in some patients, you even find dual spontaneous autolamina terminalis and floor fenestration, as in this and here, in the same patient. Both are vibrated. Now, this is an interesting case, and these are the secondary ETV. This is a very interesting case. This is a patient, a secondary, or and the redo, and everything that can an ED, uh, EVD, and everything was put in this patient to be faced with such kind of a flaw. If you stick to the rules, this is the infant development, and this is the basilar, and this is with some imagination, of course, and this is your target area. She went through 21 procedures, uh, shunts, EVDs, ATV, and everything. And hence, if you do it this way, it was successful and the patient benefited out of it. And she's a completely normal, uh, finished her studies and a mother of two children. This is another Cagliari with a redo. Sorry, with a secondary ETV, because he had a shunt put by some by another neurosurgeon, and then we came to me with a shunt failure under shunting, and we did him an ETV, successfully so, and with the post-operative MRI showing the interesting success of your procedure. Now these are kinds of ETVs, a redo or repeat. Well, don't try. They will not succeed. This one is the interesting one that I've been talking to you about. And it might explain why in cases of ETV failure, the acuity of the condition of the patient and why he develops uh, acute and when he goes into a coma uh, quicker as the shunt, uh, under shunting or uh, malfunctioning or dysfunction, See and look at the floor, how it's pulsating and pushing in a sort of regress of 
PSF into the third ventricle. And when you do your ETV successfully, you will be a course of confirmation. It is very satisfying. This is another kind, and this one is another kind. Here, you find a hole. Here, you find even a version, a floor, in spite of the previous ETV. And you go in and you do your ETV and you'll see why here it is possible very clear. And here you see the adhesions that have formed and caused the closure of the stoma that you did before. Hydrocephalus is a surgical errand. Your options are ventricular perineal shunt, ETV versus definitive surgery, EVD, or ventricular surgery. This is again another topic that we might discuss later on with all the posterior fossa tumors, et cetera, et cetera. ETV has limitations. If you look at this, this is what I was just telling you about, that this patient, okay, it was very interesting doing, doing your ETV and doing your job and visual confirmation, but as you go in and you find the multiple layers of the Lilyquist, one after the other. And in spite of doing enough big stoma, you go in and you have still here this kind of mesencephalic membrane. And you think, well, did I do my job well? As you see here, Yes, you did your job well. Signal void and the CSF is passing through from the supratentorial to the infratentorial spaces. Another unfortunate, but bear in mind, this kind of shield and tough using cephalic membrane, you cut through it and you do multiple stoma or ostium and you enlarge it with the balloon catheter and you might even cut through with the scissor to make sure that you have done your job and that is CSF flow. Last but not least, let me just show you another film. This is a very interesting case ending up in spite of all the learning curve ending up through an anterior ETV, and it did its job partially. Complications of ETV are engine infection hemorrhage, categorized by onset course, duration, severity, procedure, uh, type, and recurrence, of course. These are ETV collections. I mean, a lot of films, all 10 seconds, but I guess we don't have enough time for that. And this, these other slides that, this is again, neuroendoscopy is a versatile technique. You might go in to do your ETV and you have to do additional elucidotomy and possibly foraminoplasty or in triventricular hydrocephalus, you might do ETV and equiductoplasty. So always be open-minded. And again, unfortunately, Time is running. Tetraventricular hydrocephalus, ATV, the proximal intrasystem of the hydrocephalus type, which it shows up with uh, posterior fossa tumors after, third, after the uh, fourth ventricular tumor surgery, with mega cisterna magna or a large cisterna magna, and you do an ETV. Take home message prepare yourself for a tedious learning curve. Focus on command of morbid anatomy and anticipate anatomical variations. Expect limitations. There are do's and don'ts, doable or not. Convey and share, and share valuable knowledge. Patient safety comes first. Plan your surgery and hope for the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmad. That was ex excellent. Um, once again, very comprehensive and very, very thorough, um, with a lot of good food for thought. Um, really superb. Um, 
before I ask some questions, which are spotted in the, in the list, and also one of my own, if that's okay, just wanted to encourage the friends and participants, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A section now, and then uh, we can go ahead. I know Henry's already answered a few of them. Um, I have a question for you to begin with, and maybe Henry's comments to follow, if that's possible, uh, if that's okay. Do you use a reservoir after you've done an ETV? And if so, what kind of reservoir? Um, and what are your thoughts about that uh, regarding people who do? Um, please go ahead. Um, well, well, you mean like uh, what kind of reservoir do you mean? I mean yeah. a, a simple, a simple uh, uh, this, this yeah. reservoir or the, uh, the heat shunt uh, or even a larger one or what? So, um, yes, let me, I should expand. So, for example, uh, when I worked in Canada and when I, even in the UK, certain institutions and certainly my preference, depending on the patient has been, to put in a reservoir with a side port, which is closed off, connected to a ventricular catheter after you do the ETV for two reasons. If you do fail and you need to convert that case to a shunt, you don't need to do anything else except snip the end and connect it to a valve and a, ventric and a, and a distal runoff catheter. But perhaps the more important is if you wanted to have a measure ICP and if you were worried that they live a long distance away from a, a medical attention and <coughs> you've got an ETV which is blocked off, then it allows you an access port to measure the pressure and possibly even save their life if they live far away from any uh, medical intervention. So that's the rationale to gain access, rapid access, if the, if the stoma gets blocked uh, and so on and so forth. And I, and I know you will have, your own, but I'd just like you to share your thoughts, uh, both of you, really. What, what, what do you think about that? So we, we well, don't want I, I to do don't, it. Sorry. I don't do it. Sorry, I, I, don't do it. I, I don't do it, and I tell you why. You're defeating your own purpose of not implanting a foreign body, and by finding another way other than the shunt, I'm never against shunt, it's a, it's a totally different issue. But I, whenever I can do an ETV and get away with it, then this patient is blessed with all the complications of shunt, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And now to be made to be, are you using it as a stent or are you using it as a, a, a safeguard to, to withdraw CSF, some sort of a sump drainage that you can always resort to? Whatever. I would not, I, I'm not convinced. I never did it and I'm not convinced. Mansoor, yeah, my, my philosophy is same. We do ETV to prevent any foreign material. So that's why I would not put uh, a reservoir. What we do is when we make aqueductoplasty and standing for trap force ventricle, of course, we have a catheter inside to prevent occlusion. And this is fixed to the reservoir because I have easy access to CSF and I can remove it easily. Formerly, we did the small stents, five, mils, five centimeters. And sometimes we have seen on the initial MRI, it's a very good place in the aqueduct. Then after one year, it goes to the fourth ventricle, fifth year cervical spine, sixth year lumbar spine. <laughs> so if you, make, if you make a stent or a catheter, you should fix it to a reservoir. I agree. But if it's not necessary, I don't want to have it. Yes, I would like to have seen the images for that one, but that's a very clear answer. Thank you to both of you. Um, uh, I was going to ask a question regarding um, measurement of pressure with the new latest devices, you know, with a, such a reservoir, such a sensor device. They, have, they may have their place, but I think that was very clear. Thank you. A question that's already been asked, uh, although you may have answered it quickly in the Q&A section, Henry, and this is maybe to Ahmad to begin with. Is there any role for management of normal pressure hydrocephalus with endoscopic third ventriculostomy? Let me tell you one thing. We are we are uh, studying this as regards to the normal pressure hydrocephalus, and I'm a big fan of this CSF lumetically issue. And uh, we have seen cases relieved from normal pressure hydrocephalus by 
ein Otto TV oder ein Otto Third Ventric Kinoscope. It still has to be proven, but there are cases. Does this mean that a third ventriculostomy would do? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I can't tell you, it's not a scientific, I won't give you a scientific answer, but this is a finding. We are raising a flag uh, that we found in such cases that we follow borderline cases of, uh, of normal pressure hydrocephalus where you don't know what to do, and the TAT test was not conclusive, and then suddenly the patient improves. And why did they improve? With the follow-up or the control uh, CSF rheumetry, you find that there is an auto burden to use. Does this mean th anything? I don't know. So thank you, Ahmad. Henry? So we have done it in a few cases. And they were not good. You know, they improved like with a lumbar puncture for a while. But in the long term, they did not well. And um, we have now a prospective study underway. And I'm curious to see the results. But my impression is that finally, many of them deteriorate again and get a shunt. But you know, also when they are shunted, some fail also. So it's a difficult disease. But for me, it makes no sense. I have really done some cases and it is not working well. In, in the literature, you see sometimes they write, it's a communicant hydrocephalus, but many of these have some of the functional aqueductus stenosis. You see there's flow, but it's a little bit narrow and you see the bulging of the floor. But for me, this is not a normal pressure hydrocephalus, especially also the, well, the examples I showed with the membranes in front. That I think is a different pathology. If you see all the spaces are open, I don't believe in the theory that the, uh, uh, that the um, compliance is improved. So I don't, I, in my experience, I'm very concerned about it. Thank you very much again to both of you. Um, what do you see as absolute contraindications to endoscopic third ventriculostomy in case of intraventricular obstructive hydrocephalus? Do you think there are any major contraindications and could you just mention them? No, I think if the, if, the, if the age of the patient is very young and you see this bleeding and you see on the MRI, there are a lot of membranes in front of the brain stem, I think then it's, it's no indicated. So six months is the lower limit, maybe better one year. If you see everything is open and there is uh, just an obstruction in the aqueduct, of course I would do. If it's one frame of Monroe is, is occluded, I do a septostomy. So all these obstructions can be treated very well. But if the resorption is in question, then the success rate will not be good. And then I would not uh, recommend it, especially young patients after hemorrhage, after infection. And if you have older patients where the MRI shows no obstruction, but it's a communicating hydrocephalus. In our series, commuting hydrocephalus is not responding well. Of course, you can discuss with a patient saying it's an attempt, success rate is 25%. If you accept, we try it. But in most of the cases, you will not have uh, a good result. Thank you, Henry. Um, Ahmad, any comments to make on that? Yes, uh, i tell you one, one thing. Uh, age is a, is a relative contraindication, not an absolute one. And uh, I might go down to one month of course, explaining the risks and the percentages of failure, et cetera, et cetera, and prognosticate the case with the relatives. But I still, if I, I find that it's a purely, purely aqueductal stenosis, I would do it. I would do go. Uh, the, 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 the important thing, of course, not to have hemorrhage or infection. This is very important. And put in mind, that these studies that have been done and they have proven beyond the shadow of any doubt so far that within the first 90 days of life, uh, any shunt procedure versus uh, ETV, uh, shunt is preferable for the first year thereafter. Have better success rate. The shunt has a better success rate than ETV. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm just looking at the amount of time we've spent we've been doing this nearly an hour and 20 minutes and it's been brilliant um just wanted to invite any final comments from uh from from yourself henry and ahmad um and i'm very excited about 
the next webinar, which I hope we will have a, a one of our colleagues as a moderator, um, uh, maybe Mr. Basil Zabian, who is very well known in this field. But do you have any comments to make before we, we say goodbye and we meet again for the endoscopic colloid cyst surgery, which is later this month? Um, Henry, any, any, any comments you want to make before we end the session today? No, I just want to thank you for your efforts to oh. <laughs> spread this knowledge about endoscopic techniques. I think this should be a standard in the amateurium of a neurosurgeon to deal with endoscopic techniques. It's, it is not much difficult. It's many procedures are simple, but it is very important that you see what are the pitfalls and what are the indications. And I, I cannot stress it more and more when my residents are always look, please at the MRI. There is no foramen of Monroe. How can we do this from this side? We have to go from the other side. Or we had a case of bilateral foraminal stenosis and they said they are ETV because just because there are white ventricles, but there's no space. There is no ETV, that must be a foraminoplasty. So we have to look very precisely at the individual anatomy. That is my main message. And then you have to correlate the findings with your instrumentation. Do I have a small scope which fits to the foramen or I have an, only a big one? If you only have a big one, you better place a shunt. You know, this is what I want to give as a take home message. And I thank you again, Mansoor, for this excellent initiative. Thank you. Very kind of you, Henry. That's some uh, tremendous pearls. Thank you very much. Ahmed, any final yes. comments before we pass? Again, thank you. Thank you for giving us the chance to, to share our knowledge and convey all the messages and the take home messages. And um, I mean, uh, preaching about the, the use of the endoscope and the morbid anatomy and getting to know the anatomy. Believe you me, the, the, the fact that you get to know about the anatomy and the morbid anatomy and the endoscopic anatomy gives you an, another uh, scope, totally. So thank you for this chance. It's our pleasure. A huge thank you to the friends who have joined us, and we hope they will benefit later on uh, reviewing this webinar, which will be on the ENS website. Uh, and once again, it's an honor to have Henry and Ahmad here uh, sharing their experiences with us. And we hope many more webinars to come for this uh, aspect of the CSF task force, perhaps section to be and development of the neuroendoscopic skill set for the surgeons of the future. Thank you for your tremendous work, Henry and Ahmad. You've been brilliant to share experiences and uh, we look forward to listening to you more. And see you all at the end of June, on June the 30th, for the next webinar, the Endoscopic Colored Cyst Surgery uh, webinar. A huge thank you again. God bless you all and have a good day. Thank, thank you. you.